What the Museum of Outdoor Arts has always done best for 27 years is to create a space that brings celebration, it brings people together, it's part of business, commerce, culture. Um, lots of different identities of the space will happen because of what takes place there. And some of the best examples I can um, mention over the, the past 25, 27 years would be Harlequin Plaza, uh, the Carrara Place building, uh, of certainly the Tuscany building, and Greenwood Plaza. But I'd, I'd have to say the best project that I've ever worked on with my father, John Madden, would be the Palazzo Verde building. Well, I, uh, I developed the building, and uh, it went through probably 20 phases of, of, of design. I utilized my daughter and her experience, and along with her family, the family of the Museum of Outdoor Arts, and uh, Roger Leitner, who's married to my daughter, has always had a fascination with labyrinths. And so as we're working with the architects, Roger is working with me, uh, scheming out a design that, that emulates the short cathedral labyrinth. And along the lines there, we had a chandelier, my wife and myself, cast in Napoleon's time. And Lonnie Hansen took that chandelier, which was from an Italian villa, and took the crystal parts and re redid them into a 45-foot chandelier, which is now hanging in the, in the atrium. And then the last piece was Todd Seiler, who's connected to the Museum of Outdoor Arts. We commissioned him to do a spectacular 60-foot mural uh, that surrounds the, uh, where you leave the atrium and go into the, uh, uh, the elevator quarters of the building. But overall, impression-wise coming to this uh, space, it's, it's very dramatic. I mean, that was a big stretch jumping in at all those pieces in there, and it was expensive. And But now look at it, you think, wow. I mean, really had to have a lot of foresight to, because I was there the day you said, okay, to all three things, and I thought, God, all three of them. Now we had to pull it off. I don't think anybody knows who drew it, but it's got a lot of different um, uh, meanings to it, uh, with the rosettes in the center and the number of lunations on the outside that correspond to the lunar cycles and um, that kind of stuff. This one is, is a uh, exact replica of the one in Chart, France. that dates back to the 12th century. My interest in it was, was taking this gorgeous design and watching how the workers, the, the craftspeople, absolutely fell in love with what they were doing. And the putting these pieces together and cutting these pieces in Denver, we're all with Colorado stone, but cutting these pieces with water jets, it was a fascinating experience. And through that, I, honest to gosh, I could experience vicariously how the great cathedral builders back in the uh, Gothic times, how they must have felt when they were putting these edifices up. This is one of our few quarries that we have. You can kind of see how the benches lay in here. Uh, we do a lot of drilling and blasting as we get deeper into the ground. The stone wasn't selected because they got more points for, from it by mining in Colorado and only 75 miles away. Um, but that's really what we wanted to use. I'm not sure what they're trying to attack here, but I guess we'll figure it out in a second. Uh, just a big end loader, and just bang it and beat it and pry it, and, and they blast to get pieces that are, you know, the size of your car. Just be careful. <laughs> Watch out for flying rocks. Yeah, I mean, it's known to happen. I've actually busted out windshields doing this. <laughs> the cutting diameter of that saw is 
um, four foot three or four, something like that. It's a 10 foot blade and they're huge. And they, you know, they, they turn it a certain way so you get the grain running uh, the way it should and, and uh, slice it like a loaf of bread. Thinking about this thing for 12 years, I, I really wanted to do it uh, precision cut with a water jet. Sometimes we don't see everything in, until it gets wet, but you'll see a lot of the color come out in the stone. That's even a color, almost a gray, grayish blue that's coming out of that stone there. And then, I mean, this stone is beautiful. find yourself just watching it because it's so fascinating. You know, and that thing is at 50,000 PSI, I mean, it's crazy. But God, it was just beautiful. It's, it's a beautiful feeling when you take this piece and the radius even without a, a piece there, the radius will tell you where it's supposed to go almost exactly because of the way this tails off and it just fits perfectly and you can usually leave that piece there and when we lay all the in-between pieces in, they'll fit perfectly. Every piece has a number and that's how we're gonna track it when it comes time to crate it. It tells us we're doing a good job when the last piece fits like the rest of them. <laughs> now, if you could measure that, that gap between here and here, I don't know how you'd do it. It's less than a piece of paper, but it fits perfectly. So we're, uh, Drew and I give a high five and then we go to the next row, which is going to be the black. And we laid it dry, like I said, but then we ran out of space. So we just had to go, okay, there's only one other way to do this. Um, Got to cut them and box them and get them out there and see if they fit. <laughs> the Chandelier Chardon is a 38 foot spiral of glass with an antique Venetian chandelier sort of hung in the center of that spiraling cone. It has hundreds and hundreds of pieces. Just about every technique, every glass technique is used. They're cold cut, sandblasted, slumped, fused, um, torch blown. You know, the story in the form comes first. It usually comes in a very whole manner in my head of what's gonna happen. Then I go to materials, then I go to techniques. Yeah, it's, kind of it's an important thing for me to see and hold whatever that vision is, but it's also an equally important thing that the artisans that are working with you have the respect for that vision, that they hopefully see it too, and that they then, they work it, they work it physically. They're the ones that are working on it for months and months and months and months. Sometimes you can't get, when you get an angle cut like this, you can't get it all, always. Or sometimes I'll just slam it on the table too and just edge it. So it comes right out. So this one will give you an idea of a smaller piece, sandblasting it inside the booth here. So as you can see, I frosted this whole side. Now we'll flip it over and do the dark areas on the back. See, I think that's about it. 